the existence of this soul has been attacked by many, wishing to wipe away anything beyond what we can physically observe, and establish we are soulless zombies, made of nothing but matter. Even before I was a Christian theist, I never understood the desire to do this, especially since in previous videos, we've pointed out the evidence indicates the existence of a soul or a mind that is not emergent or reduced to matter. Despite this, physicalists attempt to offer arguments that what we call the soul is nothing more than the chemical signals inside our skull. The argument is the existence of the physical brain can fully explain consciousness and the existence of the mind. I find this hard to believe, since no physical explanation exists for how consciousness and a sense of the self could arise. We have nothing, zilch, worthy of being called a research program. Researchers are stumped. How does a mental reality, a world of consciousness, intentionality, and other mental phenomena fit into a world consisting entirely of physical particles and fields of force? Not even the most detailed fMRI give us more than the physical basis of perception or awareness. It doesn't come close to explaining what it feels like from the inside. The problem with materialism is it tries to construct the mind out of properties that refuse to add up to mentality. The fact remains there is no explanation of how the mind and consciousness can arise from physical properties. But physicalists try to argue consciousness must arise from physical processes because computers are on the path to becoming more intelligent than us and this means they will one day become self-aware and thus conscious. Thus consciousness in a sense of the self will arise from physical matter. Well this is purely speculation. But even if computers do one day fool us into thinking they are self-aware, that doesn't mean they actually are. John Sears' Chinese box argument demonstrates this. In his own words, Well, imagine that you are locked in a room, and in this room are several baskets full of Chinese symbols. Imagine that you, like me, do not understand a word of Chinese, but that you are given a rule book in English for manipulating these Chinese symbols. The rules specify the manipulations of the symbols purely formally, in terms of their syntax, not their semantics. So the rule might say, Take a squiggly squiggly sign out of basket number one and put it next to a squaggle squaggle sign from basket number two. Now suppose that some other Chinese symbols are passed into the room and that you are given further rules from passing back Chinese symbols out of the room. Suppose that unknown to you, the symbols passed into the room are called questions by the people outside the room and the symbols you pass back out of the room are called answers to the questions. Suppose furthermore that the programmers are so good at designing the program and that you are so good at manipulating the symbols that very soon your answers are indistinguishable from those of a native Chinese speaker. There you are locked in your room shuffling your Chinese symbols and passing out Chinese symbols in response to incoming Chinese symbols. On the basis of the situation, as I have described it, there is no way you could learn Chinese simply by manipulating these formal symbols. Now the point of the story is simply this. By virtue of implementing a formal computer program from the point of view of an outside observer, you behave exactly as if you understand Chinese. But all the same, you don't understand a word of Chinese. But if going through the appropriate computer program for understanding Chinese is not enough to give you an understanding of Chinese, then it is not enough to give any other digital computer an understanding of Chinese. Computers are really like Chinese boxes. They can only imitate mental understandings through syntax, but they cannot do semantics. They cannot be about anything or no meaning. So no matter how good computers get at this, they will never be conscious because manipulating syntax is not what consciousness is about. Another argument from physicalists is recent research into the primary visual cortex. Recent research has demonstrated that through technology, we can remap to a degree the visuals people see just from looking at blood flow. So some physicalists argue this means we can recreate mental images from brain scans and that the brain creates the mind in the same way. Well, the biggest problem I see with this is that those making this argument have overblown the research. The studies are looking at the primary visual cortex as patients view movie clips, then recreate them from blood flow in this section of the brain. But does the ability to recreate mental images on a computer actually imply that mental imagery or qualia is nothing more than brain activity? Absolutely not. To understand why, first it's important to understand how these studies were conducted. The mental imagery is recreated using a brain scan called an fMRI machine. First, the brain scan sends out a strong magnetic signal. Now in the brain, blood vessels contain red blood cells. Among these red blood cells, there are molecules of water, which have a special structure. When these water molecules absorb the electromagnetic wave from the brain scan, they begin to rotate very quickly, 
and eventually they emit an electromagnetic wave of their own, which is picked up by the fMRI brain scan. So how were researchers able to recreate mental imagery using this technique? Well, the researchers conducted two trials. In the first, subjects were made to view a picture, and at the same time, the pattern of activation in their brain was detected with the fMRI brain scan. In trial number two, the same subjects were made to view a picture, but this time the researchers didn't know which picture the subjects were viewing. Now the subjects had a pattern of activation in their brain which matched the pattern they had from trial one when they were viewing a picture of a cat. Therefore, the researchers could deduce that the subjects were viewing a picture of a cat during trial two. But this doesn't imply mental experiences or qualia are nothing more than chemical signals. Because nobody in their right mind would propose that mental images are the rotation of water molecules or the flow of blood in one's head. What the studies are uncovering are correlations of consciousness, not consciousness itself. The rotation of water molecules or flow of blood inside one's head are mere correlations of consciousness. They are not consciousness itself. Idealists and dualists do not deny there are correlations of consciousness inside the brain. For anyone who still remains unconvinced, consider this scenario. Suppose one day some researchers separate an eye from a brain. It is placed in a beaker and supplied with a solution of the appropriate nutrients. The eye would continue to have electrical activity, and from this, it would be possible to recreate what a person with a normal eye would see. Does this mean mental imagery is electrical activity inside the eyes? Of course not. Electrical activity in the eye is merely a correlate, which can only be used to predict the visual experience a subject will have. In the same way, studies like this one are recreating images based on correlates, such as the rotation of water inside blood vessels. This is not viewing an image created by the mind from pure imagination. It is simply looking at blood flow in the brain. Idealism and dualism are perfectly compatible with this and actually predict there should be correlates of mental experiences inside the brain. Since the brain is simply the information the mind or soul would process, as Keith Ward says and I quoted in my last video, we can thus say that the mind reads or interprets the configuration of neurons which store information that the brain has received from its environment. They may then influence this configuration by thought and further experience. The configuration is stored in the brain as a symphony is stored on a CD and is ready to be read again, remembered, at a later time. Idealism predicts there should be correlates of consciousness in the brain, since the mind encodes information in the brain, much like a CD writer encodes information on a CD. If we one day can decode this brain information on a computer screen, this would not be an issue for idealism. Since this still doesn't show how the sense of the self or consciousness arises from brain processes, it will only recreate the mental information the brain stores that the mind also interprets. So the same philosophical issues would still apply since wavelengths are not mental experiences, and no one denies that. So this doesn't establish ontological identity. When we recreate what people see, it is only the case that we are discovering correlations. Electrical activity correlates with mental experiences. The next objection comes from Leibet and similar experiments. In the early 1980s, researcher Benjamin Leibet had subjects hooked up to a machine to measure their brain activity, while they were asked to randomly decide to press a button. The subjects were asked to know when they consciously decided to press the button. He then found that prior to them becoming consciously aware of when they decided to press the button, there was a buildup of brain activity, later titled the readiness potential. Later studies saw this buildup 10 seconds prior to a conscious decision. Others deduce from this research, this means the brain is the cause of conscious activity, because the buildup of the readiness potential was occurring prior to our conscious decisions. Well, there are several problems with this. Later research has demonstrated the readiness potential was present even when subjects did not make any conscious decisions. If the supposed readiness potential is present even when decisions are not being made, then it couldn't be a cause of conscious decisions. This was confirmed in several separate studies, thereby debunking the idea the readiness potential was causing conscious decisions. In one 2008 study, subjects were told they had to press a button when they saw a cube, among many other distracting shapes like circles, triangles, or hexagons. Simultaneously, their brain activity was measured. It was found that the readiness potential was present even before the stimuli appeared on the screen. In other words, the readiness potential was present even before the stimuli appeared in which subjects did not make a conscious attention to move. Our results show that neural activity, which is present prior to motor responses, emerges well before the presentation of a stimulus. At that time, the participants were not capable of knowing whether to press the left hand or the right hand button before a stimulus appeared. In addition, the activation preceding the stimulation did not differ significantly between the two response alternatives. 
Thus, the observed activity cannot be regarded as a specific preparation to press one of the buttons, rather than the other one. Thus, the readiness potential could not be a cause of a conscious decision to move. However, even if it was causing brain activity, Leibert responded to his own work, as he still held to a belief in free will. He suggested from later research of his own, the brain activity would act on its own, but the mind had the ability to interfere and veto the buildup or the readiness potential from carrying out a decision. In other words, the brain will run on autopilot and carry out tasks, but the mind or the self has the ability to interfere by preventing the activity from being carried out. Sort of like how in everyday life we sometimes do things without thinking. Also think of Ward's earlier analogy of comparing the brain to a CD. The brain would continue to play on its own until the mind stops it. Leibniz suggested that there exists conscious cerebral cortex activity that may be blocking or vetoing the volitional process so that no actual motor action occurs. This has been called the mind's ability to free won't and take control of the brain activity by preventing it from going forward. This is cited by neuroscientist Jeffrey Schwartz in his book, The Mind and the Brain, as further evidence of his own research, which I cited in my last video. So just to quickly recap, Schwartz worked with patients who suffered from OCD and had them engage in the act of mindful attention, which over time changed the chemical pathways in the brain and reduced OCD symptoms. The mind had the ability to causally affect and change the brain, which is the same thing Leibniz concluded from his own research. If the brain actually was causing decisions to be made through the readiness potential, and the supposed evidence for it doesn't even hold up, one could still argue from the research of Leibniz and Schwartz to demonstrate the mind has the ability to interfere and produce real changes in the brain as a final gatekeeper to if a decision is to be carried out or stopped. So with that being said, this brings us to our final objection of split brain studies. In some patients, the connections between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere have been severed and some researchers argue that two distinct persons emerge. This objection is often used to show that if the brain can be divided, then consciousness can be divided, so consciousness must be dependent on brain activity. However, this is a gross oversimplification of the research. The first thing to note is that split brain patients appear completely normal under ordinary circumstances. They can drive, hold jobs, carry out routine day-to-day -day tasks, etc. The disunity in their behavior only appears under specialized testing conditions. A typical experiment testing condition, which shows this disunity, is where two stimuli are presented to the split brain patient simultaneously. One stimulus is presented to the left eye, and one stimulus is presented to the right eye. Language is dominant in the left hemisphere, therefore when the subject says what they saw, they will say a dog, but when they point with their left hand to what they saw, since the left hand is controlled by the right hemisphere, they will point to a cat. Some have asserted a split brain patient has two streams of consciousness, one in the left hemisphere and one in the right hemisphere, and argue for a physical basis of consciousness. This is called the two-stream model of split brain studies, which stands for two streams of consciousness. However, there is a lot of research which challenges the two-stream model. First, research from Hal Paschler suggests a unification of consciousness is still present in split brain patients. When normal subjects are presented with two stimuli, one after the other, the second stimulus is processed in the brain after a short period of time and not immediately like the first. This period of time is called the psychological refractory period. It occurs because the subject is processing the first stimulus, and when the second stimulus arrives, it has to wait until the first stimulus is processed. So this should not occur in split brain patients under the two-stream model, which says there is a split in consciousness and stimuli can be processed separately. But Paschler found that the psychological refractory period also occurs in split brain patients. In other words, he presented a stimulus to the left eye, which projects to the right visual cortex, and a second stimulus to the right eye, which projects to the left visual cortex. These visual cortices are disconnected from each other in split brain patients, and thus are not communicating. But Paschler found that the presentation of the first stimulus caused a delay in the processing of the second stimulus, which shouldn't occur in split brain patients because the areas where the stimuli are processed are disconnected and cannot exchange information. So this implies, according to Paschler, that split-brain patients have one unified attention, and the first and second stimuli are processed serially, as opposed to parallel. But if the mind is physical, how is this possible? Splitting the brain should split the mind. How is it possible that these patients have unified attention, even though their brain was split? Second. Two studies have found that motion and the size of visual objects are shared between two disconnected hemispheres. They are visual integration in the split brain 
in bilateral visual cross integration by human forebrain commissurotary subjects. Since visual and motion information is shared between two hemispheres, this data is also inconsistent with the two-stream model that says consciousness is split in the brain. Third, Dr. Michael Gazanica, a cognitive neuropsychologist, has found that attention is largely integrated in split-brain patients. He writes that, the data indicates that even though both simple and complex perceptual information associated with the cognitive activities of each disconnected half-brain show virtually no interactions, the attentional system remains largely integrated in the split-brain patient. Fourth, and most important, the most convincing evidence comes from observing the everyday behavior of these patients. They seem completely normal to other people, can hold down jobs, and do not experience changes in personality or humor. More importantly, they seem to have no problem in engaging in tasks which require bimanual coordination. Think of riding a bike or driving a car. The act of steering a bike itself must be coordinated between the two hands, as one hand needs to push while the other hand needs to relax its grip on the handlebar. The only problem is that the two halves of the body are controlled by different hemispheres. How is it that split brain patients can ride bicycles, walk or drive cars, or even play the piano with two hands after their hemispheres are disconnected? The research indicates that split brain patients are able to engage in very complex, bimanual tasks such as playing a Mozart melody on a piano with both hands. Thus this data is very hard to explain under the two-stream model, which holds that both sides are conscious at once. But all this data is perfectly explainable by the switch model. The switch model holds that consciousness in the split brain switches between the patient's two hemispheres. The hemispheres contribute in succession to the contents of the patient's consciousness. But for the most part at least, consciousness does not occur in both hemispheres simultaneously. This seems most consistent with the data, as it understands there is a split in the brain, but there is still a unified consciousness who simply has trouble unifying all the information in the brain at once. It explains how split brain patients could have a unified attention and how visual and motion information are unified, as well as how they could perform activities which require bimanual coordination. As various studies still indicate, there is a unified consciousness that is largely integrated as a whole, even though the information in the brain can be disconnected. So the mind is unable to grasp full control of the brain due to a disconnect. In conclusion, these four popular objections do not mount a serious challenge to the idea the mind is immaterial. This together with arguments such as Sears' Chinese box, the evidence of mindful attention, the hard problem of consciousness, and the introspective argument established that an immaterial mind is the most adequate explanation of the observed data.